Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Transfigured. This is another episode with Hank where we're going through our Church Fathers series. And specifically, we are talking about Origin of Alexandria. And this is our last episode, uh, our fourth of four episodes on Origin of Alexandria. Um, we have previously talked about uh, his book on first principles. And uh, we talked about that book twice, and then we talked about Against Celsus. And in this uh, video, we are going to be talking about Origen's commentary on scripture and a couple other miscellaneous things, and just sort of wrapping up and putting a bow on the, the whole subject of Origen um, altogether. And for those who like a foreshadow of our next episode, we're going to be talking about two other third century uh, church fathers, Novation and Hippolytus. So if you like doing your homework ahead of time, or at least just knowing where we're going ahead of time, that will be what we cover in our next episode. So uh, how are you doing, Hank? I'm doing wonderful. I hope you enjoyed the snow yesterday. Yep. Uh, well, I mean, I don't know what you mean by yesterday. It's currently snowing where I am right now. <laughs> Not snowing here, but uh, I, I didn't uh, choose yesterday, so I'm happy. I, I used my snowblower on the driveway yesterday, and there's already another new inch I noticed this morning. So the joys of Chicagoland. Absolutely. Come, come for Illinois, come for the taxes, stay for the weather. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Anyways, I, I just wanted to help Sam out here. He's at 992 subscribers. And as a friend of Sam, we want to get him to 1,000 subscribers so we can get transfigured monetized. <laughs> so Hank and I can start rolling in the dough. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Or at least maybe help cover our book budget. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but uh, we, you know, we thank, uh, I want to thank Jordan Peterson for tweeting out Sam and, uh, and uh, getting all those uh, subscribers. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I did get that. So that Jordan Peterson tweet did cause about, I don't know, a couple hundred views, at least of that video, and maybe about 200 extra subscribers. So, uh, the, you know, thanks, Jordan. Uh, um, hopefully, I can get you one more subscriber. Yeah, one more. That would be helpful. One and more. hopefully you won't lose me any, because who knows, maybe there's all these uh, people listening that were sent this way by Jordan Peterson, and they're like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't what I subscribe to. Never mind. Unclick. <laughs> well, you know, maybe Paul Vanderclay. But there you go. <laughs> there you go. So um, I think um, we want to start out with, we've, we've teased the last three discussions about why, about origin being uh, declared a heretic. Yeah. So I, I think that's where you wanted to start, right? Yeah. So let, let's start out talking about origin, the afterlife of origin. Um, we, if you're, at, we've talked about the sort of introduction to origin multiple times at this point, and and for now, I would encourage you to check out our previous episodes, especially the first one. That's the one that we spend the most time talking about origin's biography. But this is uh, his post biography. So, sort of as a reminder, origin dies uh, in about two hundred and thirty five. AD, he died from the, the wounds and the aftermath of being uh, tortured and imprisoned and persecuted for about two years. Um, so he was released from that, but uh, the damage that it did to his body ultimately killed him not too long after he was released from prison. Um, one of the subsequent popes of Alexandria uh, declares him as a martyr, and that pope, what, his name was Dionysius of Alexandria. He had been a student of Origen, so in the immediate aftermath of Origen's life, he was recognized as a saint and a martyr in his own local church. Um, he, you know, there had been some controversy in his life. One of the previous popes of Alexandria had you know, clashed with him and had sort of not failed, didn't want to ordain him. So Origen had to leave uh, Egypt and move to modern day Israel, where he spent most of his career. But even by the end of his life and shortly after his life, he was recognized as a saint and a martyr in his own native church. 
And he was very widely influential on um, Christian theologians, both during his life and the immediate aftermath of his life, especially in his own native city of Alexandria. Um, in the in probably the next series of episodes, we'll get closer and closer and then actually talk about the Arian controversy itself. But the Arian controversy is mainly a dispute between Alexandrian theologians over how to interpret origin. Both Arius and Athanasius, two of the leading figures of the Arian controversy, both claim to be faithful followers of origin's teachings. Um, and we'll, uh, I'll just tease you that we'll get in, I'll, I'll pull some quotes that uh, later in this episode that can help you understand how both the Trinitarians and the non-Trinitarians, although that's really not quite the right way to describe it, the Arians and the Nicene Creed supporters both thought area or uh, at the origin was on their side. So anyway, in the immediate aftermath, origin was seen in a positive light. Maybe you didn't agree with everything he said, but you know that that's different than thinking that he's a heretic. All right, so once by the time we get to the late fourth century, so this is like the 370s to the 390s AD, there's this guy named Epiphanius of Salamis, which is, a, uh, he's a bishop from Cyprus. He was a sort of a heresy hunter. That was sort of his business. As Christianity was consolidating its power in the Roman Empire, there was a greater and greater focus on rooting out heresy and sort of standardizing the system of belief that was, you know, becoming prominent in the Roman Empire. And so he gathered a bunch of quotes from Origen and sort of showed that like, hey, this Origen guy is actually a heretic, we need to get rid of him and look how influenced he is by Greek philosophy, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The accusation of being too influenced by Greek philosophy is a accusation against Origen that will come against him time and time again. And I would even somewhat repeat that accusation. I think there's a fair amount of truth to it, but that's part of it. So um, a very important figure named Jerome, uh, we'll cover him eventually. Hank is super excited to talk about Jerome. Uh, you guys have similar personalities, I think. Um, he, he sort of joined in the anti-originist um, tribe and petitioned the bishop at Jerusalem, a guy named John, to condemn him as a heretic. John, the Bishop of Jerusalem, kind of liked Origen, and so there was this conflict, and, and Rufinus was a guy who kind of supported Origen. You might remember from previous episodes, Rufinus is the one who translates on first principles from Greek into Latin, and so there is also this spread of Origen from the Greek world, right, because Origen wrote in Greek, and his works are starting to get translated into Latin, so he's starting to make some ripples in the Latin world, and that's part of what's causing this controversy. And so um, some of the things that Origen was accused of teaching was universalism, uh, reincarnation of souls, Arianism, and uh, the incorpor incorporeality of God, that is that God doesn't have a body. Um, this sort of leads to street riots in Alexandria between origin supporters and origin deniers. Um, when we come to the or when we come to the Arian controversy, there will be lots of street riots between uh, different theological tribes in Alexandria. Theology becomes like a blood sport in uh, Alexandria. Anytime there's a controversy, two sides whip up and they fight each other in the streets and it was, a, it was a deadly blood sport. And so there were some people that supported Origen that had to flee Alexandria because the anti-Originists were winning the, the street gang battles. And so a guy uh, that you might've heard of named John Christosom harbors the pro-Originists in, in Constantinople, the people fleeing Alexandria. And so this leads to John Christosom, Christ how do, you, how do you say that? You're the Catholic. You're supposed to know how to actually say John Chrysostom. Chrys I know how to say Irenaeus. That's my Chrys Chrysostom. John Chrysostom. I'll, I'll let you. I'll let you, you I was know, adding an extra that. syllable. John Chrysostom. And John Chrysostom is called golden tongued. He's actually, um, the Eastern Orthodox will trace their liturgy back to John Chrysostom. So he's an extremely important figure. But during his lifetime, he was deposed for being a harborer of pro-originists in Constantinople. And so when, uh, when John gets exiled, that's sort of 
brings peace to the parties. But during, but there was no official condemnation of origin. There was just kind of like this kerfuffle that involved Jerusalem and Alexandria and Constantinople and some church fighting. Go ahead, Hank. And I want to put that in perspective. Think of it this way. Origen dies in 250, and it's 120 years later. Yeah. Okay, that would almost be like when the United States started in the 1780s, and we're talking about someone becoming uber controversial 120 years later. Yeah. Right. Or it would be like us arguing about Abraham Lincoln or something yes. like that, you know, Correct. like, you know, uh, should we topple the statues of Abraham Lincoln or should we not topple the statues of Abraham Lincoln, right? It was yep. uh, something kind of like that. All yeah. right, but Origen isn't out of the woods yet. So the, the fourth century uh, Originist controversy sort of fizzles out and people move on and focus on other things. All right, so then there is the what's called the second originist controversy, and this is in the mid sixth century. So this is around the years like 540 to 555 or something like so that. 300 years after origin died. Yes. Three, That's a it, long time. That's yes. 300 years. Okay. All right, so there were there were two groups again of monks, right? So th this is another thing that a, a lot of these later controversies involve two camps that are fighting each other kind of for influence and, and um, standing within the Christian community. So the first group is called the Protostistioi, which means that uh, Christ is sort of the, the first created. And so this was a battle over the nature of Jesus's human soul. So these two groups each believed in Jesus's human soul, but the protostistioi, the people who thought that Jesus's soul was created first, um, had they they liked thinking of Jesus's soul as kind of uniquely divine in a way that other human souls weren't. And there, these sorts of monks also really emphasized ascetic practices, right? Like fasting and poverty and, and those sorts of things, because if you think Jesus is really different from us, then you think that perhaps the way to become closer to Jesus is sort of deny your human nature and stuff like that. And that can go in sort of an ascetic direction. And then there was the second group, which was the isochristoi, which iso means similar or, or same as, right? So same as Christ who thought that our human souls were the same sort of thing as Jesus's soul, and that our souls pre-existed up in the pre-embodied soul state, which was something that Origen taught, and that our souls can become divine in the same way that Jesus's own human soul became divine, and that they emphasized intellectual contemplation and using sort of your mind and spiritual practices and prayer to become sort of unified mystically with the one in your mind, which is something that Origen talks about. And so in other words, they had a more optimistic take on how humans could become like Christ, whereas the people who thought that we were very different from Christ had sort of a pessimistic take, which led them in a, an ascetical direction. All right, so there's these two types of monks that have a relatively different take. And the one type of monk blames the the ascetic monks blame the intellectual monks uh, for following origin too closely all right and so this culminates in the second council of constantinople which is also recognized as the fifth ecumenical council and this is held by the emperor justinian the emperor justinian is one of the most important and influential of the byzantine emperors he builds Hagia Sophia, and he also helps restore the Byzantine. The Byzantine emperor, empire had been suffering losses and stuff. He kind of helps re-strengthen it and revivify it and stuff like that. So he's a very important emperor. But one of the things that had happened at the Council of Chalcedon in 451, about a century earlier, the, um, the Oriental Orthodox churches had been excommunicated for not um, ascribing to the statement of Chalcedon. So what happens is the Egyptian church and also a couple other churches like um, the Armenian church break off from communion 
with the main church, right? At this point, the Eastern Orthodox and the Western church are still in communion with each other. So the kind of the Roman Constantinopolitan churches are still together, but Egypt gets excommunicated for not following the Council of Chalcedon. All right, so this causes a problem that there is this political rift between Egypt and the Byzantine emperor, empire. And the reason why the Oriental Orthodox, which is what the Egyptians are called still to this day, is that they thought that the Council of Chalcedon overemphasized Jesus's humanity and overemphasized the distinction between Jesus's humanity and his divinity. They didn't like the idea of Jesus having two natures. They thought that kind of over-separated the divine part from the human part. They liked emphasizing that there was only one nature in Jesus that was both divine and human at the same time, instead of one nature that was divine and one nature that was human. They thought that that left open the door to Nestorianism and other ideas that they didn't like. So part of what Justinian is going to do is he wants to reincorporate Egypt back into his empire. So he kind of sides with the protostoi, protostostoi, right? The people who thought that Jesus's soul was very divine against the people who thought that Jesus's soul was very similar to ours. And part of the reason he's doing this is to throw them under the bus to try and demonstrate to the Egyptians right, that he actually affirms their theology and that they should get back in communion together. This plan doesn't work, but as a consequence of this plan, Justinian orders the burning of all of Origen's works and, and condemns him for the rest of basically Christian history as a heretic and never to be recognized as a saint. And it should also be said that we don't know anything about Origen's relics or bones. And it could be even the case that his bones were burnt or destroyed or something at this time, so he couldn't be venerated as a saint. So Origen is, so one of the reasons why we don't ne have nearly as many of the writings of Origen as we know that existed is because of this decree from the Emperor Justinian to burn all of his works. And part of the reason why we have most of the works that we do are the Latin translations is because this um, command didn't make its way over to the Latin West. It was only executed in the East. Um, so uh, I, I don't know, that sort that was a long winded thing. And hopefully you would probably have to know a fair amount of church history already to understand this. But one thing I think that you can clearly understand is that origin was viewed as dangerous, but mostly in the context of political church battles that were going on that had something to do with him, but not everything to do with him. And it's unclear if he was fairly represented in this. So anyway, I've been talking for a while. Hank, what do you what do you think of all that? Well, I think that what we what we see is that politics has infested the church, right? Okay. Justinian has an issue. His the empire has has atrophy. He would like to grow the empire back. And he also has a significant theological dispute within his truncated empire. He's got to figure out how to how to manage that, right? So we're talking now 300 years after Origen died. So, but you know, in essence, hey, this guy's 300 years back. It's what you're seeing even today, right? Let's okay, we're gonna throw these people out because. They're old and white or what or slaveholders or whatever they are, right? Because what we do is we just look at one thing and say, unacceptable. Mm -hmm. He did that too. It was a political, it was a political move, right? Okay. Now I understand why the Eastern Church has more of a dislike of origin than the Western Church. Yeah. Which makes it interesting. I think you're going to interview Father John Bear, right? Who's I, I hope so. We've been right. in communication. It could fall through, it could not fall through. I hope that I will be talking to Father John Bear. Oh, Father Bear, if you're watching this, this is becoming a big blowtorch now, you know, <laughs> okay? Um, but the, and it was interesting because I watched the Bishop Barron over a year ago who spoke a little bit about origin and said how unfairly he was treated as a heretic. Mm. So given the nature of this, and we're gonna go, we're gonna start diving into origin, 
think the one thing that you and I have discussed, origin is always thinking and throwing out his ideas. And he'll even say that some of this is speculation. Yeah. And you're going to show a little bit in John that we're about to go into that one paragraph origin says almost sounds like universalist. The next paragraph, he's 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 not sounding like universalist, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we were discussing this I, I earlier. I would compare the only person I could think of that who gives me an idea of like origin is Peterson. Mm -hmm. I listened to Peterson for four hours with Rogan and Rogan had to keep on roping him back in, right? I, hey, uh, Jordan, I asked you this question. You've gone over here, but you haven't answered this question over here. Or I don't understand what you said because you just said this, but it sounds different than what you just said. Yeah. The problem is that Origin didn't have a conversation partner that, that was dynamic enough to rope him back in. Yeah. So yeah, that's interesting, but you said this here, but you said that over here. Okay. And it's clear that there was no one at that time, right? That really could, uh, you know, there was no- He was in a league of his own in yeah, terms of his intellectual capabilities. Time, yeah. Earlier, there had been Irenaeus and Martyr who could have probably been good conversation partners, right? And later there was Jerome and Augustine that could have been good conversation partners. But in that time, he was it. There was nothing else. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I, and I, I think another interesting thing to note is the final thing that Origen was condemned as a heretic for was not his idea about the pre-existence of souls, was not for right. universalism, was not for this, there, the other thing. The final thing that did him in was for thinking that Jesus's soul was too human. So he had a too human view of the Christology of Jesus that is ultimately what gets him condemned by Justinian and the people that were supporting their ideas of intellectual uh, you know, monk practices based off of Origen's teaching of the humanity of Jesus's soul. Yep. So that that is ultimately the the la the straw that breaks his back is having a view of Jesus that's too human for later centuries tastes. I, I think and this is where we get it back into transfigured. The ultimate conversation that Christians should be having is what is the nature of Jesus? Okay. Sounds good to me. <laughs> right? What's the nature of Jesus? Because so long as you uh, so long as you institutionalize churches, let us talk about it without uh, you know trying to suppress us. I'm oh, I'm fine with having that on. conversation. This is a fine institution right here, Sam. <laughs> As a matter of fact, quite frankly, we have more subscribers than most churches have members. Yeah, well, especially if your uh, plea to have people click the button works, then yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Well. Um, my point is, is that it's, you know, it's because I, I would posit as a Trinitarian that most Trinitarians have very little idea of the nature of Jesus. They could give you a few sentences, but if you probe, they start getting very unhappy. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, that I would say is a deficiency of teaching uh, of churches that, you know, um why why do you have more knowledge all well, you have to defend yourself yeah why why did the early christians have more knowledge i, I would posit than christians today they had no choice mm -hmm. peter said give an answer for the faith that you hold right right oh why did you have to give an answer because everybody was pushing back on you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay you know you can just say you couldn't do like the old Doobie Brothers song. Jesus is my, is just my friend. He's okay. just all right with me. Yeah. Yeah. It's just okay. That, that that's 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 not going to wash um, when it comes to these issues. And so, Origin thinks deeply about these issues, and like a lot of deep thinkers, in my estimation, you're going to contradict yourself. Well, what about this? Oh, okay. I'll write that down. You know, two days later, well, what about this? I'll write that down. And, uh, 
Today, we have people read and say, hey, you, you contradicted yourself. You really didn't have that. Remember, most of the people who were Christians at that time were not literate. Right. And he was way up there on the literacy scale. I mean, it, what was it? He was a teenager. He's basically running the theological school in Alexandria, one of the great theology schools of early Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Think about that. That you, It'd be like a 17-year-old young man or young woman running Harvard. Yeah, yeah. Which, in my estimation, Harvard would probably be better off if you had somebody <laughs> that age running it, but then that's just me. <laughs> so en enough of my digression. Why don't we go into the Gospel of John and, 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 and do a, a, a nice dive there? Sure. Yeah. One of the one of the books that we have the most of even uh, and we have a lot of it in its original Greek, we don't have all of it, is his commentary on the Gospel of John. And um, it is full of interesting theological insights. It's it's dense, and he he goes over the Gospel of John, but he he goes on tangents a lot right. of the times. Like yep. he'll just take one sentence from the Gospel of John and go on a three or four paragraph tangent about what that uh, sparks in his mind to talk about. It can sometimes be a little bit hard to follow, and sometimes be a little bit like, okay, so what does this have to do with the Gospel of John again? Um, but uh, one, I, one of the things that I think is interesting, so this is right near the beginning of his commentary on the Gospel of John, and I think that this says just a lot about Origen as a person. So this is a quote um, in Book 1, Chapter 3. Most of us devote most of our time to the things of this life and dedicate to God only a few special acts thus resembling those members of the tribes, that is the tribes of Israel, who had but few transactions with the priest and discharged their religious duties with no expense of time, no great expense of time. But those who devote themselves to the divine word and have no other employment but the service of God may not unnaturally, allowing for the difference of occupation in the two cases, be called our Levites and priests. And those who fulfill a more distinguished office than their kinsmen will perhaps be high priests, according to the order of Aaron, not that of Melchizedek. So for Origen, the most important activity, the most valuable activity that a Christian can do to benefit their community and to worship God is to study scripture. And he, he views the people who spend their time studying scripture as like priests among the Christians, right? In the same way that in the Old Testament, priests did the sacrifices and, you know, did all of the stuff on behalf of most of the people who weren't involved in that. So in the same way, the people who exegete scripture are like the equivalent of priests for Christians. And even then, among them, there might be super exegetes like Origen himself, who count as high priests. Uh, in the Christian community. And I think that it's uh, one thing that just has to be said that's true about Origen is he's a scripture geek. He, he is a Bible geek. He loves scripture. And his main focus of his spirituality is on reading scripture, understanding, understanding scripture, and making scripture known. That is his main motivation and his main understanding of his own vocation, and he views that as the highest vocation within the Christian community. It's interesting, he doesn't say that the presbyters or the deacons or the bishops are the equivalent of priests in the Christian community. It is those who exegete scripture that are the true fulfillments of the Old Testament priests in the Christian community now. Which might have, uh, I could see where Bishop Demetrius in Alexandria would take umbrage to that. Yes, yes. Now, an interesting about the thing, let's do a, a very high level overview of Origen's um, exegesis of John, his commentary. He, he puts top, if you're going to put a hierarchy of the Gospels, he puts John on the top. Yes. yes. There's no doubt in his mind, the, the, the most important Gospel isn't the, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's John. Right. There are four Gospels, um, and the Gospels are sort of in a special place in Scripture, right? There's a certain sense in which all of Scripture is the Gospel, right? right. The Old Testament is about Jesus. The letters of Paul and Peter and et cetera are also about Jesus. So in that sense, they're all about the gospel, but four books 
are in a special place because they are full gospels. And one of the books among the four stands apart even further, and that's the Gospel of John. Yeah. And a quote from Origen. Now, of the scriptures we which are current and are believed to be divine in all churches, one would not be wrong in saying that the first growth is the law of Moses, but the first fruits, the gospel. Yeah. Okay. So already what you have early in the churches is Origen, who's the top dog, is say, hey, the Old Testament is divine. Yep. Okay. But the gospel is on top. Right. There is a hierarchy within scripture. Right. And, uh, and like, this is something uh, Catholic and Orthodox churches will do this. Like when you guys read the gospels in a liturgy, you have to stand up if it's being read from the gospel, but you don't have to do that if it's like a letter of Paul or something like that. Right. 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 So you, you stand up, you, you, you do the sign of the cross, your head on your lips and your heart. So we're acknowledging God in our mind, our mouth, and our heart. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's a, a special way, a, an embodied way of giving extra special elevation to the Gospels. Correct. And so Correct. Origen is kind of even supporting that same sort of idea all the way back in the 200s. And so he, um, you know, he also, you know, very clearly, because obviously, and this is where we could have fun with transfigured, right? He's basically saying the, the he's clearly say, he clearly says that the, the the first three gospels do not do not teach shed any light on the divinity of Jesus, right? But the John does, yes. Okay, and that's why it's the most important of the gospels is it presents the the divine view of Jesus, not just the bodily view of Jesus. Right. Or the human view of Jesus. You know, if John was never written, you'd you know what? We'd all be we'd all be biblical Unitarians. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> that's part of our point. <laughs> but John was written. But John was written. Yeah, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yes. All right. So let's talk about John one one. So uh, Origen spends like an inordinate yes. amount of time just going through like every single word in the first verse of John 1, 1 and explicating what the meaning of each individual word in each syllable and how it all fits together. So the first uh, thing that he talks about is the word arche, which is translated beginning, right? The, you know, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God, right? That's the most common translation of John 1.1. 1, 1. So the word beginning is arche. And he goes through and he's like, okay, arche is a complex word. It has six different meanings. The six meanings are, it can mean like the spatial beginning of something, like the beginning of a stream can be called an arche, right? The source of a stream. It can mean the, the beginning of an event or the beginning of a story, right? The beginning in time. It can mean the source or substance from which something emerges, like you know, the, the source that something comes out of in a substantial way. It can mean like an archetype, right? Like that gives rise to other types, right? Even the English word archetype has archi, right? The Greek word in it, right? Um, and like, uh, and then the fifth one, it could mean the elementary principles, right? In the same way that letters give rise to grammar, letters are like the R key, the source, the fundamental principle that gives rise to grammar. For the record, uh, Origen's book on first principles is actually called Peri Archon, right? About archies, or the plural of archie. So that's why it's called on first principles because it's using that fifth definition of archie there on the elementary principles of the faith. Just like you have to learn about the ABCs to learn how to read, you have to learn about the elementary principles before you can learn about the complicated stuff. All right, or it can mean sort of the intellectual principle which precedes action. And an example he gives is like a architect who will write a blueprint before he builds a house, right? 
And this is actually, it's that sixth definition that he chooses. And one thing that I think is fascinating about this is like, nowadays we have online tools or lexicons, right? Where you can look up a word in the Bible and you can be like, okay, here's the Greek word behind it that's being translated. Okay, and here's my lexicon that gives me the four or five or six definitions of that word so I can help better understand what it means. You know, they didn't have those sorts of tools back then, but um, origin is sort of like, one of the first people to really try and dig in at this level and get at this level of the text. So he then goes on, I won't quote the whole bit, but basically he says, okay, so what is the intellectual source of the logos, right? If we're trying, if we're going to pick the sixth definition, which means the intellectual principle, which gives, gives rise to the thing, what principle gives rise to the logos? And he picks wisdom. So like God's wisdom is like inside God the Father, and it has like the plan for the whole universe kind of inside God's head, the same way that a person building a ship has the plan for a ship inside their head before they build it. So the logos comes from God's head, basically. And so when it says in the beginning was the logos, what he actually interprets it to mean is not the beginning of time, but he means in the source was the logos. Okay, and what's the source of the logos? It, so he basically understands it to mean in, the logos was inside wisdom, or the logos had its source in God's wisdom, which is not the typical way I think that most people understand that first phrase. I think most people understand to be the beginning of time, right? In the beginning was the word. They think, okay, at the beginning of time, the logos was already there. But Origen understands it to mean the logos was inside God's wisdom. Well, I have a question. Do you think he's pulling that from Proverbs in the wisdom literature? Yes, he he explicitly quotes Proverbs eight to support that view. The wisdom yeah. of Solomon. One thing, again, for people who are evangelical, he's using. A lot, he's doing a lot of quoting from books that evangelicals would say are not part of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Yes. Barack, he is. And, or, well, he quotes a lot of books that even you Catholics don't think are part of the Bible, too. Right. <laughs> he, he has a very wide definition of the whole canon. Well, again, that's because the canon, you know, I don't think he has a wide, yeah, he has an extremely wide definition. And so he's pulling things out that a lot of us would sit there and say, where did that come from? Mm -hmm. but it's clear to me on the wisdom he's definitely calling that from proverbs the first few chapters where you know wisdom you know when Solomon's writing that wisdom was with god from the beginning yeah so again one thing just to remind everyone the old testament was a big deal for the early church fathers yes a much bigger deal than it is for us today. They're pulling stuff from the Old Testament, archetypes, typology, and saying, here, look. Um, you know, he, he even he even states that uh, Isaiah, isn't Isaiah the gospel? Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. so it, it's, it's... So it's, he's, he's supporting his interpretation of Genesis with a lot, a lot of quotes from Proverbs, but also some quotes from the, the wisdom literature and stuff like that. Yeah. So, so now that he's defined our key, right, which is, he means the intellectual source, right? Now we move on to logos. Okay, so what's the logos, right? We've defined what our key means in our K. Okay, we've got that part down. And ho logos, okay, was the logos. All right, what does logos mean? I think this next passage will ruffle some people's feathers, but I think it's quite fascinating. So this is from book one, chapter 23. Let us consider, however, a little more carefully, what is the word which was in the beginning? And again, I think, I think they should translate, I think they should just not even translate, they should just say our key, because beginning already gets English people's brains thinking about time, but he's already said that he doesn't think our key means time. So I'll just, I'll just translate it as our key. So I'll start over. Let us consider, however, a little more carefully, what is the word, what is the logos, that is, which was in the our key? I am often led to wonder when I consider the things that are said about Christ, even by those who are in earnest in their belief in him. 
Though there is a countless number of names which can be applied to our Savior, they omit most of them, and if they should remember them, they declare that these titles are not to be understood in their proper sense, but tropically, that is, metaphorically. But when they come to the title Logos, they and repeat that Christ alone is the word of God, they are not consistent and do not, as in the case of the other titles, search out what is behind the meaning of the term word. I wonder at the stupidity of the general run of Christians in this manner. I do not mince words. It is nothing but stupidity. That is the harshest that I think Origen ever is in all the things that we've read. He sometimes, you know, when he was in against Celsus, he would be pretty mean. Yeah. But so what does he reserve his harshest words for? It's for people who think that Jesus is the Logos in a one-to-one -one sense, but don't realize that the word Logos is being used of Jesus in a metaphorical sense. In the same way that Jesus gets called the door or gets called the light of the world, or gets called, you know, uh, the, the stone which the builders rejected, right? All of these things are metaphorical titles that explain something about Jesus. And so he insists that the Logos is also a metaphorical title that teaches something about Jesus, and that people who say that Jesus is the word are utterly stupid, you know? <laughs> right. well, let, let me steal, man, the people who think that Jesus is Logos, right? When, when we say Jesus is the door, right? Or we use metaphorical terms, right? We we know we're using those metaphorical terms, but when John writes and says, the word was with God, right? It, you know, maybe a genius like Origen sees it and says, well, see, that's metaphorical. Yeah. And an average reader, even at that time, right? And what would have been interesting is having Origen and Paul have a discussion about this. Yeah, well, Paul never calls Jesus the Logos. So. Right. <laughs> Correct. Well, something else Origen says, the, 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 he, he's, he makes it clear the apostles didn't write en enough. <laughs> yes, he does say that. Right. That's true. Yeah. Okay. He's, you know, he said they didn't write enough. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, he calls the apostles writing what? The gospel. Yeah. Okay. So, for and this is where I think Origen gets, you know, gets in deep weeds, right? He 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 is definitely big on metaphor. Yeah. So so here's the in the next paragraph, book one, chapter twenty four. He goes on to say this: Some students do not take anything at all out of the statement that the Savior is the Word, and it is important for us to assure ourselves that we are not changeable and with caprice in fixing our attention on that notion. If it admits of being taken in a metaphorical sense, we ought not to take it literally. When we apply the mystical and allegorical method to the expression light of the world and many other analogous terms mentioned above, we should surely do the same with this expression also, right? So again, the, the word is a metaphorical title for Jesus. So the question is, is what is the logos, right? Yes. So he has a distinction between Jesus and the logos, right? Uh, and so the logos, is up there in the eternal trinity right he does believe in a trinity although it's a little bit different from an orthodox trinity we'll get to that more but like god the father he has his wisdom the logos is an emanation of god's wisdom and is sort of like this second god figure will come and i mean second god literally yeah, that's, his, that. that's yeah. his platonism yep right and then the the word gives rise to the spirit right there's this three this triple cascade from the father Right. The Father begets the Logos, the Logos then makes the Spirit, right, or creates, he even uses the word creates for that. And so the Logos is like this eternal truth where there is one thing kind of up there in the eternal realm, yep. and then log there are Logoi, right? He makes a distinction between the Logos and Logoses, right? He would say Sam has a Logos, maybe even Hank might even have a Logos inside him, we're not quite sure, but everyone has some amount of participation in the Logos. But Who that's- Who wants you, Sam? Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but but all of our all of our intellectual capacities are because we have a share and participation in we have a logos in us that participates in the logos right and Jesus is a human who has a full participation in the logos but he isn't the logos himself so very briefly this is where you have 
Athanasius ignoring this, right? Right. Or tossing it out. He, ah, no. And Arius saying, boom. Right. Right. And th th this is one of those things where it's a little bit of a choose your adventure with origin, right? Yep. You can find some things where he sounds super Trinitarian and super like later orthodoxy when he's talking about eternal generation and all of these things. Or you could emphasize some of the parts of uh, origin that have a very human Jesus and have the logos as a creation and a second God apart from the one highest God, right? And then you can sound like an Arian. Uh, I mean, again, his writing is very good in here it's, it's confusing yeah okay i mean he is getting down into the weeds that's absolutely amazing i you know it's just he's really getting into parsing words in some very very um arcane ways i think all right well the most arcane distinction is yet to come okay all right <laughs> See, i i i i fed you i i i, I, yes, I served, you it served, up served up good so we've talked about in the beginning we've talked about was the word and we've made a distinction between the logos and jesus right so he he doesn't actually think john 1 1 is about jesus specifically it's about the the logos specifically all right so we talked about our key we've talked about logos now it's time to talk about with god and was god right that's the final part of the verse so um this is in book two chapter two we next notice John use, John's use of the article in these sentences. By the article, he means the word in English, the, right? Yeah. So we notice John's use of the article in these sentences. He does not write without care in this respect, nor is he unfamiliar with the niceties of the Greek tongue. In some cases, he uses the article, and in some, he omits it. He adds the article to the logos, but to the name of God, he adds it sometimes only. He uses the article when the name of God refers to the uncreated cause of all things and omits it when the name is God, when the logos is named God. So what's he saying? In Greek, John 1 1 is anarchy and ho logos. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with ho theos was with the god right it has a the in front of it which often doesn't come across in english translations so the word was with the god and the word was god but it doesn't say the word was the god it just says the word was god with no article mm -hmm. so what does he make of this distinction he says when john uses the phrase the god he's talking about god the father right the uncreated cause of all things that's right. another way of saying god the father but when it uses the when it doesn't use the article it's an adjective right so when it says the word was with the god it's saying the logos was next to and with god the father and the word was God, he understands that to mean it's saying the, the word was divine, right? It's not saying the word was the same being that God the Father was or that they're, you know, one being together or that they're in a triune unity or something like that. It's saying it's a description of what the word is. Um, it's a qualitative description. So if I had to in paraphrase Origen's understanding of John 1.1, 1, 1, it would be something like this. The Logos was in its source, that is God's wisdom, and the Logos was with the God, and the Logos participates in divinity. Right. All right. Now, my pushback on this would be, John is writing about Jesus. I would look at origin and say, your sentence in context with the, with script, with, with, what John has written makes no sense. I would agree. <laughs> okay. I also think that even in John 1, 1, that the Gospel of John has Jesus already in mind in, in that description. I would have a different interpretation than you do, but I, I would also have a different interpretation than Origen. Right. My, my, I, sorry. You're, 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 what he's doing is he's being clever. <laughs> but he's taking it out of context. He's reading, he's, he's, he's giving a reason to put his sort of Neoplatonic metaphysics right, right. there in, in the gospel. And, and yeah. I say, hold it. Who is 
John, John is writing a gospel, which we agree is good news. He's an evangelist. Mm -hmm. Who is he going to want to talk about? Right. He's not want. He's not going to want to parse words on wisdom and things of that nature that you want to do. Okay, cowboy. <laughs> he he wants to talk about Jesus, and that's the problem that our friend Origin had. Nobody sat there and said, "Slow up, slow your roll." Yeah, you're getting too metaphysical here, Origin. You know, concentrate yeah. on yeah. Jesus. Yeah. yeah, because if somebody somebody you know grabbed him and said. What you just wrote doesn't make sense in context with the rest of what John is saying. Mm -hmm. And you tell me that John's taking care of what he's writing, but that, that first sentence is clearly careless and would throw the, the, the reader off on, on Jesus, who he is, and what he means. Mm -hmm. Now, you and I could have a disagreement about what the first the first sentence means. I would say that it means that, that, that John, the writer, is saying that Jesus has a similitude to god mm -hmm. okay and you're saying no nah, that's that's there's something else here there's something else here i would also you challenge and I you both, that you I, and I, both I think boot I think, out origin <laughs> yes i think also that the beginning does refer to time but i think that it mostly refers to the beginning of jesus's ministry okay that that, that he means like 25 a.d not you know the the way back at the beginning of time time <laughs> uh boy we could have some fun with that captain yeah well you know in john 1 3 he immediately starts talking about john the baptist so you know i i think that the prologue of john is a summary of jesus's life with strong theological allusions to genesis but it's actually about, you know, oh, Jesus is strong. Life. <laughs> what do you mean strong in the beginning? Well, and, it's, and it's the type. It's, the, it's the archetype and the foretype, right? <sighs> the Genesis, the, the beginning in Genesis is about the original creation, but the gospel of John is about the new full creation that happens in Jesus and that happens in his lifetime. So it's sort of like he's alluding back, but he's also talking about how the more important beginning is the beginning of Jesus. And that's that that's why children we need sam in the church <laughs> <laughs> all right so anyway that that get, and, and you know that we're it sounds like we're reading a lot of quotes but i assure you we're skipping over way more than we're quoting in this in these passages to give right. an idea of what origin thinks and, and i want to just and then sam let's keep moving that is why origin is so important, because the arguments that we have today, I believe, find the roots in origin and, quite frankly, his, his stream of consciousness thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that other, whether it's Krista, uh, who's another one, Maximus the Confessor, you have all these, these early church fathers grab onto certain parts of origin they really like. Yeah. And... You know, so if, I, you, you if know, was, you can see in the heretic, notes the I quote. Think would understand more what's going on here. Go ahead. Yeah, you can. You're 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 hedging yourself because you know you see what quote I have lined up next. So uh, so this is this is a quote that I think um, helps. Uh, anyway, this is one of his clearest quotes on his Trinity, and one of the clearest things he says about the Holy Spirit. And then I'll I'll dissect it later. All right, so this is from Book 2, Chapter 2 of On the Gospel of John. All right, now if, as we have seen, all things were made through him, we have to, so basically he's, he's, now, on, he's now on verse 2, right? Yeah. All things were, were made, or verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made, right? So he's exegeting that passage, and so he's wondering how, if everything was made through the logos, does that apply to the Holy Spirit or not, right? That's the question he's dealing with. Now, if, as we have seen, all things were made through him, we have to inquire if the Holy Spirit was also made through him. It appears to me that those who hold the Holy Spirit to be created and who also admit that all things were made through him must necessarily assume that the Holy Spirit was made through the Logos, the Logos accordingly being older than he. And he who uh, shrinks from allowing the Holy Spirit to have been made through Christ must, if he admit the truth of the statement of this gospel, assume the spirit to be uncreated. There is a third resource besides these two 
that of allowing the spirit to have been made by the word and that of regarding it as uncreated, namely to assert that the Holy Spirit has no essence of his own beyond the Father and the Son. But on further thought, one may perhaps see reason to consider that the Son is second besides the Father, he being the same as the Father, while manifestly a distinction is drawn between the Spirit and the Son in this passage. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, he shall not have forgiveness, either in this world or the world to come. We consider, therefore, that there are three hypostases, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and at the same time we believe nothing to be uncreated but the Father. We therefore, as the more pious and truer course, admit all things were made by the Logos, and that the Holy Spirit is the most excellent and the first in order of all that was made by the Father through Christ. And this, perhaps, is the reason why the Holy Spirit is not said to be God's own Son. The only begotten only is by nature and from the beginning a son, and the Holy Spirit seems to have need of the Son to minister to him his essence, as to enable him not only to exist, but to be wise and reasonable and just, and all that we think of him as being. So only God is uncreated. Right. God creates the Logos, and then the Logos creates the Spirit. These are three hypotheses, which is a word that will show up later in, in discussion, but there is a cascade of creation and a cascade of order and a cascade of even seemingly almost time, right? And so when the Arians will say that God, that Jesus is created, that the son is a creature, you know, they can pull from these passages and then they can even say that the Holy Spirit is created through the son. Right, so there's this triple cascade of creatures, and um, this is certainly not something that would pass the standards of later orthodoxy, um, oh. even though it is setting up later orthodoxy in some ways by talking about them as three hypotheses and, in some sense, sharing essences and passing essences to each other. But the later orthodox doctrine of the Trinity will have the Holy Spirit be breathed out by God the Father. Right. And if you're Catholic, you can say that the Holy Spirit is generated by the Father and the Son together, which Origen alludes to as a possibility. But for um, later Trinitarians, the Holy Spirit needs to have its source in God himself and not his source in the Son. So there, this is interesting in that it's moving in the direction of later Trinitarianism. But I would say even more than that, it's moving in the direction of Arianism, and that the Arians can find a lot of support for their doctrines in origin, and they certainly did. He, this is what I mean. It's, if, if a Christian today were to read origin on how he thinks of the Trinity, they'd say heretic. Yeah. Absolute yep. heretic. Yep. <laughs> But he's but it's also one of those things where he gave later Orthodox Trinitarians a lot of the language that they'd use. Oh, and he's the first example of it. So it's sort of like you have to, you know, uh, throw your your theological ancestor under the bus, even though he is still nevertheless your theological ancestor. Uh, he certainly he and Tertullian were the first two to really start the Trinitarian theology. Right. Um, I think Tertullian read does he go heretic yeah. um, what what i think again is the the colonization of of platonism into how he's thinking about the trinity mm -hmm. and his and his what really informs his thinking about the trinity is that first sentence in john and how he interprets it rather than interpreting it in light of the context of the whole book. Mm -hmm. So in essence, your position or my position is far more, has far more resonance than, than, Arian, than, than uh, Origen's position. Right. And there's another quote that I sort of skipped over. This was from also book two, chapter two, 
um, he's going into the distinction between the God and, and kind of little g God. Is, um, he says, you know, Jesus, the Savior, says in his prayer to the Father that they may know you, the only true God, right? But that all beyond the very God is made God by participation in his divinity. So another thing that is different about origin is that the logos is divine by participation, not by essence. So basically, in, in Orthodox Trinitarianism, Jesus essentially is divine. The Son is essentially divine. He is given full divinity from the Father and has it sort of divinity in himself uh, in a certain sense. Even though he receives the divinity, it's essentially in him. But in origin, the Son is divine through participation. God right. sort of at all times is emanating participative divinity into the Logos. And Jesus, through his soul, is in communion with the Logos. And so Jesus is getting, you know, kind of God energy beams from the soul, Jesus's soul's um, embeddedness inside the Logos, right? It's sort of a, a cascade that's given at a constant state. So that, that's another interesting thing is that the Logos doesn't have divinity um, in itself at all times, but is constantly being given participation in God's divinity. So that might sound like a distinction without a difference, but just wait until we have a civil war in Christendom in the next century over these questions, and you'll right. understand that these distinctions are differences and that they, they made a, a big deal to the people about 100 years after this was written. Well, they made a big deal once Constantine became a Christian. Yeah. Okay. It was maybe a big deal, but it wasn't excommunicable because it's the old Ben Franklin saying we either hang separately or we hang together. Yeah. Okay. And the church was being persecuted and yeah, you know what, Sam and Hank disagree on the, on the, on the, on the Trinity, both state that Jesus is their savior and believe in basic Christian, um, Christian uh, doctrine. So you know what, we'll tolerate the differences, right? It's when the arguments became easier to do because now you had the, the, the Roman emperor saying you can't persecute Christians anymore. So now Sam and Hank are able to take their argument that was in a church and yeah. take it out in society. And, and you and I are competing to become the bishop, right? Yes. And if I become the bishop, then I have a lot of wealth and power and resources at my disposal. And so if I can cast you as a heretic, uh, then I can get you disqualified from this competition for the job we both want. Status and ambition. Yeah. yeah. Status and ambition, right? I mean, it's 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 the story of man since the beginning. It's it's you know, uh, and we see that all the time. Um, let's go on to um, why origin is such a feast to read, because he, he he then comes out and you say, oh, he's a universalist. And then he comes out in the next paragraph and say, no, he's not a universalist. Yeah. If you want to go into that a little, Sam. So yeah, let's talk about universalism. So, so here's a quote from book one, chapter 37 of the gospel, on, on the gospel of John. All right. Um, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. It is not said that he will take away, take, he, it is not said that he will take it away in the future, nor that he is at present taking it nor that he has taken it, but it is not taking it now. His taking away sin is still going on. He is taking it away from every individual in the world till sin be taken away from the whole world. And the Savior delivered the kingdom prepared and completed to the Father, a kingdom in which no sin is left at all, and which therefore is ready to accept the Father as its king, and which, on the other hand, is waiting to receive all God has to bestow fully and in every part at that time when the saying, 1 Corinthians 5.28 is fulfilled, that God, 1 Corinthians 15.28 is fulfilled, that God may be all in all, right? So Jesus is preparing the world for full communion with God, right? Right now, the world is not in full communion with God, but God will be all in all eventually, so Jesus is taking the sin away from every individual in the world, and he won't stop until the job is done. Well, what does that sound like? 
So how, how many sinful people will be left at the end of time, according to this passage? No one, because what he's what he's not done is then looked at the 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 you know the apocalypse of John, right? Mm -hmm. Which says basically there's gonna be there's gonna be a little there's gonna be a little tussle before that's all done. Right. And so this is one of those passages, you know, the esoteric randos. Hi guys, I, I see you out there. There's a there's a contingent of the Paul Vander Clay community that is a uh, lover of universalism and strong supporters of that. And, you know, it, it is totally clear to me how one could make a clear case that um, origin is a universalist. Like this is just one clear quote, but there are lots of quotes like that, right? right. That, that is not just a one-off thing. This is an important part of origin's theology is the unification of all things with God in the end. Apoctostat, apoctost, there's a word that I have trouble saying, apoctostasis or something like that, which is the idea that everything becomes into full union with God at the end. And that is the trajectory of the course of the universe. And that is the eschatology of the end time is that God will be all in all and that Jesus will have succeeded in taking away the sin from every individual. So, okay, so how could anyone be in hell? How could anyone be damned? How could anyone be left out? Well, it sounds like universalism, right? You know, slam dunk. Okay, here's the next paragraph after that in the same book. This is book one, chapter 38. The last quote was from book one, chapter 37. All right. Once we know that Simon Magus, who gave himself the title of the power of God, which is called great, was consigned to perdition and destruction, he and his money with him, right? So he's talking about Simon Magus, that character that shows up in the Gospel of Acts, who tries to buy the Holy Spirit from Paul. He's saying that he gets assigned to perdition and destruction. Uh, yep. So... Uh, so when does Jesus take away the sins of Simon Magus and unify him with God and that God is all in all? Is, is, is Origen an annihilationist? Is he saying that, that Simon Magus gets destroyed? And so therefore he, he doesn't count as part of the kingdom that gets given to God at the end because he's gone? Or, but he just said every individual, right? So this is one of those things where Origen... I can totally understand how people back then, and this was an accusation in his lifetime and after his lifetime, that he was a universalist and thought even the devil and demons would be saved. That was a common accusation against him. And many people still think that Origen was universalist, but I could just as easily assemble a list of quotes that sound non-universalist. Yes. <laughs> so I don't know, uh, Hank, how do, you, how do you make sense of that? <laughs> uh, he doesn't read, he doesn't... Um he doesn't uh, retain what he just wrote. He, it's clear. I mean, that I'm being snarky, right? It's, how can you write X and then right after it, write Y? Right. Okay. okay. And some universalists might say, well, actually the perdition is just the refining fire that Simon Magus's soul has to go through. And the destruction refers to his flesh and not his soul. And his soul will still end up what unified did with God. What perdition, though? <laughs> yeah. Not what do we mean by perdition? All right. Okay. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to pull a quote from his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. Yes. This is in Book 10, Chapter 13 of his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. All right. Now, since these things are written about, so he's exegeting the parable of the, the fish caught in the net, where some fish get yep. put in the good pile and some fish get thrown out, mm -hmm. right? Which is not the most universalist passage in the New Testament. So Origen is exegeting this passage. Now, since these things are written about the net and about those in the net, we say that he who desires that before the consummation of the age and before the coming of the angels to sever the wicked from among the righteous, there should be no evil person of every kind in the net seems not to have understood the scripture and to desire the impossible. Wherefore, let us not be surprised if before the severing of the wicked from among the righteous by the angels who are sent forth for this purpose, we see our gatherings also filled with wicked persons. And what that and would that those who will be cast into the furnace of fire may not be greater in number than the righteous. So what he's saying is there are some people out there who 
interpret this as saying that there will be actually no evil persons by the time that this net, you know, the eschatological yep. net of judgment is pulled in. They seem to have not, those people, universalists, Origen seems aware of universalists, seem not to have understood the scripture and to desire the impossible. If that is not a clear condemnation of universalism in Origen's own works, I don't know what it would take. Um, and he even speculates that there will be a greater number of people who are thrown into the furnace of fire than the people that are saved. And, you know, you could quote, you know, uh, broad is the path to destruction and narrow is the way to support that idea. Hence, Sam is a Unitarian, but not a Universalist. Right. I'm not a biblical Unitarian Universalist. But anyway, honestly, I'm if, just trying to help you out, Sam. Thank you. I appreciate that. I oh, always need to for. distinguish myself from my other Unitarian siblings. But um, one thing, it, honestly, if I were to try and reconcile origins seeming universalism with his seeming not universalism, I think that there are a couple possibilities. One possibility is that he actually was a universalist and that later people edited those parts out and edited some parts in that made him sound not like a universalist. That's a possibility, that there was a desire by the fans of Origin to make him seem more orthodox than he actually was. So maybe passages like the one I just quoted from the commentary on Matthew are examples of such a thing where the real historical origin was universalist and later interpolations uh, kind of edited that back possible. I don't think that's the most likely. I think that the most likely scenario is that Origen had two things that he held in tension. He held in tension his speculative theology, which made sense to him, and the teachings which he received from the church. And that at the end of the day, these things were mostly in agreement, but sometimes in tension. But if he had to choose between them, he would choose the teachings of the church. I think that his speculative theology was universalist and that he maybe almost didn't even like that conclusion of his own um, philosophical speculations that went in the direction of universalism, and that sometimes he would have to counteract that with what he viewed as the orthodox teaching of the church and of scripture, which was non-universalist. And so that when he's spitballing his speculative theology, he's talking about the, the inevitable reunion of all things and all individuals with God. That is his speculation part of him, but his part of him that's loyal to the doctrines of the church is non-universalist, and these things are at the end of the day not well reconciled with him and that you can get one or the other coming out of him depending on what mood and mind he's in at the time that he's writing. And that that's why I think that you can make a case by certain quotations that he's a universalist and by certain quotations that he's not is this distinction between his philosophy and his loyalty to tradition. You're nodding your head. So I think you agree with me on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, so, I mean, and you're going to go over that later in, in an a interview he had with a bishop in Saudi Arabia. Yes. Yes. Um, so anyway, we should move on a little bit. Uh, yes. th this might be our longest origin episode, but uh, we've got more to do. All right. So let's move on to the Gospel of Matthew, because the last quote I was talking about was from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I don't know. What are your general impressions, Hank, of his commentary in the Gospel of Matthew? Well, as we did, as um, he, he basically likes to break down parables in Matthew, whereas in John, he's really going after who is Jesus, right? The logos and the wisdom and everything of that nature. He's, he's doing a lot of speculation. So he speculates on the perpetual virginity of Mary. I think, isn't this... We, I think this might be the first Christian writer that talks about the perpetual virginity of Mary. Yeah, it's the first writer that we have the name of, I think, that actually right. comes out clearly in, in favor of the perpetual virginity of Mary. There's another work, The Ascension of Isaiah, which also seems to support the perpetual virginity of Mary, which is probably before origin, but we don't know who wrote it. But basically, when there's a passage in the Gospel of Matthew that talks about Jesus's brothers and sisters, right, where right. the people of Nazareth are like, 
who's this guy? Who does he think he is? Isn't he the son of Joseph and Mary and aren't his brothers and sisters here? Why is he, you know, thinking that he's someone special, right? Um, Origen defends this idea that those were probably sons and, or children of Joseph prior to his marriage with Mary. And therefore, Mary would only have been the only have been the mother of Jesus, and therefore would have been a virgin for the rest of her life. And he even says that Jesus was the first fruit among men of the purity, which consists in chastity, and Mary among women, for it were not pious to ascribe to any other than to her the first fruit of virginity. So in, in the church in his time, there was males who lived celibate lives and females who lived celibate lives. So he's sort of saying Jesus establishes the order of celibate males and Mary establishes the order of celibate females. And that's part of the reason why he supports the idea of the perpetual virginity of Mary. Yep. Um, by the way, that... That took hold of the Eastern Church very quickly. It took a long time to get hold of the Western Church. And one thing that should be said is that this is about the most that he ever talks about Mary. Yeah. That so clearly he has a high view of Mary, but he doesn't call her the queen of the universe or the chief among saints or there are or, or uh, give a talk about the Immaculate Conception of Mary and all right. other. There, so there. There's some extra Mary stuff that seems Catholic from a Protestant perspective, but it's not the full-blown Mary stuff either. And overall, he doesn't talk about her very much. He, he's talking about her here because she came up in the passage, but he doesn't spend much time talking about Mary. No. It, it, but so far, what we've seen of the early church fathers, they have not mentioned Mary very much except as a historical figure. Right. He, right. Does, and, a little more, he does a little more than that, though. He does a little more than that, but not not extra much. He doesn't talk about her role up in heaven at the present moment or or any of those sorts of things that will come up later. Um, and mo and I'll just say most of the early church fathers, they'll talk about Mary and they'll say very nice things about her, but they wouldn't say anything that a Protestant wouldn't sing in a Christmas song. <laughs> right. right. Um, uh, it, it's not it's not extra beyond just her being a very admirable and amazing person. And for origin, it's very important that she establishes the um, virtue of female chastity. Yep. Now, the, then, he, then, of course, uh, we have the Eucharist. Um, and you, why don't you go over that? And then I, I'll give a little of uh, my own feedback on that. Sure. Uh, one thing I should say is that I have only found one paragraph in all of the thousands of pages of origin that you and I have read that yeah. talks about the Eucharist. And what's interesting is other church fathers that we read, like Ignatius of Antioch, right? The writings of Ignatius of Antioch, you can read in about half an hour, but because right. they're not very much of them. It takes takes a couple of weeks or months to read all of origin it takes you know half an hour to read all of, of ignatius of antioch and ignatius of antioch mentions the eucharist like 20 times right, right. in his short writings but origin only talks about it once and part of me almost wonders why it is that he doesn't talk about it more uh it's interesting i don't know before i go into this quote do you, i don't know what do you what do you make of his lack of attention on the subject in general all right I think, though Origen was an agnostic, he was dipping his toe very close to Gnosticism. And the Eucharist is definitely not a Gnostic belief. And because it's the body of Jesus, and Gnostics don't like Jesus having a body. Right. It's not at all. And so what's interesting is he had to have. In, in action, he had to have a doctrinal view of the Eucharist, because if he didn't, they would have kicked this, that, that was, that was not, you know. Because certainly he was celebrating the Eucharist on probably a near weekly basis right. in his actual church, so he had to, he had to have some theology of it, yeah. but it doesn't seem like, it doesn't seem like a thing that he, that seems important to him. It almost seems like he explains it away in the quote that I'm about to read, as opposed yes. to using it as a source of theological reflection. Right. Yes. All right. Go ahead. So this is a uh, book 11, chapter 14 of On the Gospel of Matthew. All right. Though what is called the bread of the Lord may be thought by some, by the simpler disciples to sanctify, 
And the saying is, I think, not to be despised and on this account demands clear exposition, which seems to me to be thus. As it is not the meat, but the conscious of him who eats with doubt, which defiles him that eats, for he that doubts is condemned if he eat, but if he eats not of faith, and as nothing is pure to him who is, def who is defiled and unbelieving, not in itself, but because of his defilement and unbelief. So that which is sanctified through the word of God and prayer does not in its own nature sanctify him who uses it. For if this were so, it would sanctify even him who eats unworthily of the bread of the Lord. And in the case of the bread of the Lord, accordingly, there is an advantage to him who uses it when with undefiled mind and pure conscience he partakes of the bread. So neither by not eating, I mean by the very fact that we do not eat of the bread which has been sanctified by the word of God and prayer, are we deprived of any good thing, nor by eating are we the better by any good thing. Even the meat which has been sanctified through the word of God and prayer in accordance with the fact that it is material goes into the belly and is cast out in the draught. But in respect of the prayer which comes upon it and according to the proportion of the faith becomes a benefit and is a means of clear vision to the mind, which looks to that which is beneficial. And it is not the material of the bread, but the word which is said over it, which is of advantage to him who eats not in, eats it not unworthily to the Lord. And these things indeed are said of the typical and symbolic body. So what's going on? So there are those passages in Paul that are mainly concerned about whether or not you can eat food sacrificed to idols, right? right? And Paul's basic point is like, look, it's not the thing in itself that's the problem but it's how you perceive it with your mind, more or less. And, you know, some people can, you know, not be bothered by it, but some people are, right? So therefore, you should have concern for the people that are bothered by it, right? And then he also takes the quote from Jesus, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but it's what's com what comes out of him. And these couple things, where I think he's basically saying, simple Christians think that it's the actual bread that is doing the sanctifying work. But that's, a, that's what a simple Christian would think. For him, it is the intellectual contemplation of the Eucharist and what it, what it typifies or what it symbolizes that is actually doing the work. Because for Origen, all spirituality is focused on the intellectual contemplation that helps you become more unified with the logos. And Origen also has a relatively low view of materiality. He's yes. a little bit like a Gnostic. He's not full-blown Gnostic, but he's like the Neoplatonists in that the material world is not particularly great. In fact, there's even one point where he says that the first, per the first creature that was given a material body was Satan when Satan sinned against God. And the first thing to enter a body was, was Satan himself. And he, he quotes that as the Leviathan. He uses a quote from the book of Job to say that Satan is the Leviathan and that the angels laughed at Satan that he got put in a body first, right? So that, yeah. that says something about, uh, the, about Origen's view of materiality. So I think because of that low view of materiality, he doesn't think that the bread and the wine in the material sense can be part of the sanctifying work. And that really it's what they typify and symbolize and how your mind understands that, that actually is the sanctifying work. And that, um, and that's why you, that's why the bread, if you are a worthy person helps you, but if you're an unworthy person hurts you, it's not the bread itself. It's what's going on your, in your mind. And in, in a strange way, this is kind of similar to Zwingli. Yeah. who is the kind of the father of the Protestant, what a lot of Protestants view the Eucharist, and that Zwingli will say that the bread and wine are just symbols, and it's what you, what you do in your mind that actually does the work. And so it's the, it's the intellectual side that is the thing, not the material side. And I was honestly quite surprised to see this because I remember Brett Sockold and a couple other people say that the Protestant view of the Eucharist doesn't show up until the Reformation. But I could say that origin is quite similar to a Protestant, although for different reasons. 
I think right. it's because of his emphasis on intellectual contemplation as true spirituality and on his low view of the material world that he right. has what sounds kind of like a Zwinglian view of the Eucharist. Yes, it's clear that he has a low view of the material world. And it's also clear that, again, you know, and I'm not being a, an apologist, he, he's musing because he could not have, he could not have been, he could not have said this is doctrinal or he would have been taught. We would have had to worry about the third, the, the fourth century and the sixth century. He would have been tossed. Right. And it, it's, he's also, Origen can be a little elitist sometimes. Yeah, I think you little. would agree with that. Yeah. He can be pretty elitist where he yes. looks down on the simple interpretation of things that a lot of his fellow Christians have. And he kind of feels like he has the true spiritual intellectual understanding. It's not that the lower Christians are wrong. It's just that they don't have the full spiritual yeah. knowledge that he has. So I think he would have thought that people who had a real view of the Eucharist were simpletons. Right. Yeah, like I said, Origen, you know, with his martyrdom, you, you respect the way that he, 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 he lived his life. And yet, he is the first church father that I've seen that's come out and basically bifurcated elite and non-elite. Yeah. Which I, I would continue to stay, which I find a very dangerous yeah. type of... Uh, of because I agree. It, it's my least favorite part of Origen is his yeah. elitism and his uh, intellectualism and his splitting the simple from the enlightened. Yeah. It, it, by the way, people aren't stupid. They know when when you think when they think you're smarter than that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we see that today, um, in 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 so many ways. And why you're seeing the big fights within the evangelical church is that we have people that say, I have this higher knowledge than you do. Right. And I, I, I laugh because um, a lot a lot of Christians own their nationalism, but uh, those who are of the higher order don't own their imperialism and their own nationalism. We, get, we see, um, you know, this big fight over Dr. Francis Collins of NIH, right? That the evangelical church was used by Francis Collins to encourage people to get vaccinations. It was framed in such a way that we have this knowledge that you don't have. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you love Jesus and your neighbor, you should get a vaccination, which is a really elitist way of framing it. What, you know, whatever your take on the subject, the framing is elitist. Yeah. It's and, very elitist, right? And, and I, I would people say People don't that, like that. Yeah, I would say that part of that might be because uh, Origen wasn't clergy, right? Yep. He, he right, when, one of the first quotes that we talked about today where he said that the people who expound scripture are right. the real priests, right? He views the theologians and the scriptural explainers right. as more important than the actual clergy of the church. But what do the actual clergy do? They actually have to interact with and, um, and uh, attend to the needs of people, elite, middle, and simpleton alike. And that I think that because Origen didn't have a clerical role that caused him to be as involved with the lives of ordinary people and instead viewed himself as doing this special set apart role of explaining scripture and writing these gigantic commentaries that enabled him to have a puffed up view of himself that looked down upon common folks. Yep. Uh, I, we're going to, I got to get back to work, but we, why don't we wrap it up with the dialogue of Heoclitus? Is that okay? Yeah, Does that sounds good. Stuff? Yeah. All right. So um, one of the last work that we'll talk about today is the dialogue with Heraclides. So one thing that's kind of interesting is that this work was actually recovered in an archaeological dig in Egypt in the 1940s, and it was found hidden in the wall of a building and that the manuscripts dated to the middle of the sixth century. And what's interesting, what happened in the middle of the sixth century, if you remember the beginning of the episode was the second council of Constantinople. So probably when someone got the order that they were supposed to burn the works of origin, instead of following it, they hid it inside this building. 
And maybe they thought that that order would be revoked later and then they could take the work out and you know not have to have destroyed it. But maybe that order never came. And so the, the manuscript re remained hidden inside this building and was found in an archeological dig you know, 70 years ago. And what's fascinating is that it is a cross-examination of the orthodoxy of a bishop named Heraclides. And these other bishops are worried that this Bishop Heraclides is not orthodox. And so who do they bring in to cross-examine this bishop and determine if he's orthodox? They bring in Origen. And so what's fascinating is Origen will later be condemned as a heretic for not having a correct view of the Trinity and Jesus. But during his lifetime, if you wanted to find out if someone else was a heretic, you brought in Origen to cross-examine them because he was the most orthodox person. So this is, this is a fascinating thing. And um, we won't read the whole thing here for the sake of brevity, but I'll mention that Dale Tuggy has a podcast where he, I'll link to this in the description. Hank is smirking because Dale Tuggy is a Unitarian philosopher. Uh, but I'll, I'll link to his uh, podcast episode where he talks about this dialogue in more detail. But one of the things that is interesting is, let's see here, I'll go kind of, all right. So Origen, this is about halfway through the cross-examination. Origen says, is it true then that there was a God, the Son of God, the only begotten of God, the firstborn of all creation, and that we need have no fear of saying that in one sense there are two gods, while in another sense there is one God? Heraclides says, what you say is evident, but we affirm that God is the Almighty, God without beginning, without end, containing all things and not contained by anything and that his word is the son of the living God, a God and a man through whom all things were made, a God according to the spirit, and a man inasmuch as he was born of Mary. Origin, it seems you've not answered my question. Explain what you mean, for perhaps I failed to follow you. Is the father a God? Heraclides, assuredly. Origin, is the son distinct from the father? Heraclides, of course. How can the son, how can he be a son if he's also father? Origin, while being distinct from the Father, is the Son himself also a God? Heraclides, he himself is also a God. Origen, and do two gods become a unity? Heraclides, yes. Origen, do we confess two gods? Heraclides, yes, but the power is one. Origen, since our brethren take offense at the statement, there are two gods, because there was an audience listening to this, so presumably the audience was getting mad at this two God talk. We must formulate the doctrine carefully and show in what sense there are two and in what sense the two are one God. Also, the Holy Scriptures have taught us that several things which are two are also one. And then he goes on to give some examples. And the examples of two things that are one thing is like Adam and Eve are one flesh, right? And then those of us that are in Christ are one spirit, right? And those sorts of things that these examples of two things or many things being one together are united, right? And then Origen says, when we pray, because of the one party, let us preserve the duality, but because of the other party, let us hold the unity, and et cetera, et cetera. And then he quotes Jesus at the end saying, I and my father are one. So the sense, there's a sense in which there's two gods and a sense in which there's one God. Right. And the sense in which there's one God is that the, because of their moral unity, in the same sense that all Christians are united in one spirit and become one body together, in the same way the Father and the Son are united. But it's a moral unity, right? It's a cooperative unity. It's not yes. an ontological unity like later Trinitarianism. So the... That it's a it's a fascinating dialogue and it's a peek into what's interesting, like the the this bishop is being cross-examined, and I don't think he gets excommunicated. I think he passes the test, but right. passing the test in the two in 240 AD meant that you had to believe that there was one God in one sense, two gods in a different sense, and that these two gods were morally unified. Right. Um, so 
that that wouldn't pass muster in a later uh, cross examination. Oh no. oh no! But yeah. that was that was the peak of orthodoxy then. And I think one other thing I know we should wrap up quickly. But this is also the sign of the beginning of how important this topic will be in determining right. who's orthodox and not. Right? It's one thing to say, okay, yeah, there's a right answer and a wrong answer to these questions. But it's another thing to say that this question of the Trinity and Jesus's relation to God is the thing that determines orthodoxy and is the most important question. And this is also something that we see starting to happen in, or, in origin is the prioritization of this topic as the most important theological topic. Yep. And I think that's an excellent summation of where we, and it's, gonna, it's an excellent starting point to going into the other church fathers because yeah. origin is sort of like, we've had the very primitive church fathers, but now we get origin and then we get a, we're stepping up now into all what's happened over the next 1800 years in Trinitarian theology. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to yeah. uh, further conversations on this. I hate to cut it off. This has been a wonderful conversation, but unfortunately. Yeah, well, we got long winded, but we were talking about origins. So yes. until next time, everybody, uh, Hippolytus and Novation for next time. And I hope you uh, learned something about origin. Uh, so thank you all for listening.